Welcome to part 6 of the Bread Circus's Phantom Menace retrospective. In the last part, we took a look at the Old Republic. Now for the other half of the story. Galactic history is an eternal struggle between light and dark. In this video, we'll run an inquisition into the Jedi Order. Anakin Skywalker would like to become a knight. Just what sort of organization is he joining? Where do the Jedi come from? If you've seen a few of our videos and feel like we've earned your support, please take time to check that you're still subscribed to the channel. Leave a like, perhaps. Fiddle with the notification bell so you're notified as soon as we upload new videos. Why not join us on Discord? We promise it's only half as bad as that sounds. Perfect organism. If you'd like to support us financially, consider becoming a patron or clicking join under this video. YouTube members get access to Imperial Rank Insignia in the comments section. For as long as Star Wars has existed, Anakin has been a Jedi. Your father wanted you to have this when you were old enough. He mostly existed to inspire Luke in the original movie. But your uncle wouldn't allow it. It was clear that any prequels would need to show the process of Anakin's training. He feared you might follow old Obi-Wan on some damn fool idealistic crusade like your father did. What is it? Your father's lightsaber. The Phantom Menace begins with little Annie knowing stories about Jedi. One day, a very suspicious chap walks into Watto's shop. You're a Jedi Knight, aren't you? What makes you think that? I saw your laser sword. And you look like a hippie and a wizard had a baby. Thank you. Oh, my bones are aching. I can see there's no fooling you, Anakin. The Skywalker boy quickly notices a chance to escape Tatooine. It's clear he doesn't quite understand what it means to be a Jedi. Have you come to free us? No, I'm afraid not. I think you have. Why else would you be here? At the very least, Annie realizes he can escape slavery if he gets recruited as a knight. Will you take him with you? Is he to become a Jedi? Yes. Our meeting was not a coincidence. Nothing happens by accident. At first, Qui-Gon hadn't paid any attention to the slave boy. If Watto had accepted Republic credits, Obi-Wan might never have met Skywalker. What, you think you're some kind of Jedi? It takes an hour or two before Qui-Gon really notices the wee lad. You should be very proud of your son. He gives without any thought of reward. Jedi Knights have never been particularly numerous for their order to survive requires a constant stream of new apprentices. To make matters worse, being Force-sensitive is quite a rare trait. While this was not intended as a recruitment mission, Jin is prepared. Well, I have acquired a pod in a game of chance, the fastest ever built. Clearly, Jedi are equipped with a midichlorian testing kit. They need to take advantage of any time a Force-sensitive is found. Part of that process is being able to easily evaluate candidates in the field. It's also important to have an objective standard you can point to. When you're dealing with some local princess, you need to know where your scapegoat is. That one. That place is... No. No. The one I'm pointing to. No. 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 You never want it to be your word against hers. Sorry, exalted one. I just get the feeling your daughter won't make a good wizard. That won't do at all. You need to take her side against the cruel machine. Look, your worshipfulness. Let's get one thing straight. If it were up to me, you'd be on the Jedi Council already. But the test says you only have six midichlorians. That's a poor midichlorian count for a glass of water. Anakin doesn't have to deal with such problems, of course. He passes the test with flying colors and with bells on. The cells have the highest concentration of midichlorians I have seen in a life form. It is possible he was conceived by the midichlorians. This kid is so incredibly awesome that he set the all-time high score. Qui-Gon is absolutely certain that no Jedi has such an affinity for the Force. Over 20,000. Even Master Yoda doesn't have a midichlorian count that high. No Jedi has. The Jedi Order had calibrated their midichlorian scale, expecting Annie not to exist. I'm certain the Jedi Wiki was updated with, except for Skywalker, on all the articles. To properly induct the lad, Qui-Gon's next task is very important. Training to become a Jedi is not an easy challenge. And even if you succeed, it's a hard life. After this conversation, the Jedi can say, I told you so. It's all Obi-Wan's fault. 
Anytime Anakin complains, he'll hear, You can't say we didn't warn you. Where Luke wasn't ready to leave home, little Annie jumps at the call to adventure. And pack your things. I have on my stone. Yippee! That's a good thing. There would be no point in anything else. Skywalker has to become a Jedi. Might as well just get on with it. It makes Vader all the more tragic if Anakin had always loved the Jedi. I had a dream I was a Jedi. I came back here and freed all the slaves. This cannot be the usual scenario, though. The movie tells us that there are ways of finding potential Jedi. Had he been born in the Republic, we would have identified him earlier. The Force is unusually strong with him. That much is clear. Qui-Gon seems confident that if Anakin had been born on Naboo, the Jedi would have noticed. We know of two ways to detect that someone is strong in the Force. One is to have a Jedi close enough to sense the Force potential and track down its source. We can immediately rule that out. It doesn't work on a galactic scale. Not even Jedi can detect every Force sensitive in the star system. It'll work. It'll work. <laughs> Vader's on that ship. That leaves only one option the midichlorian blood test, an exceptionally simple and easy process. Obi-Wan activates a small device that is clearly shaped like a microscope. Wait a minute. I need a midichlorian count. This machine is called a meson telescope. It can't be too specialized because it doesn't belong to the Jedi. We would have seen them carrying it off their ship and through the ventilation shafts. They've gone up the ventilation shaft. Mison telescopes are just something the Naboo ship had on board. Testing for Medichlorians is not particularly difficult or expensive. Had he been born in the Republic, we would have identified him earlier. Only one conclusion makes sense. Qui-Gon was talking about an organized campaign of blood tests on a galactic scale. This is actually quite practical, despite the magnitude of the task. A wealthy planet like Naboo can test all its own citizens. Out on the fringe of the Republic, it would work quite differently. Instead of each city doing its own tests, they don't happen anywhere on the planet. In theory, each sector of the galaxy contains about 50 inhabited star systems. All you really need is one meson telescope placed on the capital world of each sector. El meson telescope well desagree with me antes. Outlying star systems only need to send a blood sample attached to the paperwork. This is all part of registering your colony as having a new Republic citizen. Best of all, you might be able to do this via email. Remember that Qui-Gon has the actual blood sample in his comlink. Obi-Wan has the machinery that carries out the midichlorian test. Wait a minute. How do you get a file of blood from your walkie-talkie to the microscope? There is no physical connection. The sample tray doesn't fly away under its own power. This entire process is carried out over the wireless. You could just call it a mistake. But I don't think so. It's too blatant. This would be a genuine plot hole if it were an accident. I need a midichlorian count. The reading is off the chart. Blood tests over the radio is a fantastic sci-fi premise. That one idea could support an entire series of novels. Adding this concept was intentional, and it was very cool. Sadly, few people even noticed. A bored journalist might write a listicle of prequel plot holes. Do other channels mention this in their prequel videos? How about those red letter media ones? If I get a brain aneurysm as the result of this review, can I hold the filmmaker's response? I'm genuinely asking. I don't have a transcript handy to look it up. Assuming it was intended, how would that even work? We know that it doesn't teleport the blood. Star Wars does support teleportation, but not this casually. Transporters in Star Trek can eliminate the short walk to and from the turbo lift. What the hell is going on? Are you all right, number one? I've had it. Let's put all this technology to work, figure out what is going on, and get the hell out of here. Almost everyone in Star Wars will tell you it's physically impossible to teleport. This conversation's over. They will say this even as they travel through hyperspace on a ship full of droids and aliens. Therefore, Obi-Wan has no physical blood sample to work with. Qui-Gon's comlink must have sensors in it, capable of reading all relevant information. There are actually two machines involved here. One is a tiny module with a sample tray and midichlorian detectors. The other is the main comlink with a large expansion slot at the bottom. It's a good design, similar size to the equivalent from the original movie. I happen to know that this particular prop is based on a razor. 
a Gillette-branded women's razor to be precise. Those shoulder buttons on the comlink are actually the blade release catch. We could be stuck here a very long time. There's something about this boy. We see them used just like the transmit key on a walkie-talkie. Get smoother. Sensor Excel smoother. And have fun. This was always obvious, right from the first day the movie was released. A mold was taken of the original razor, then multiple props were cast from that. Each comlink has a few extra bits attached, and they're painted metallic. This doesn't break my immersion, I actually respect this choice. The wavy lines on the grip are perfect, they bring to mind radio waves. Originally, that part of the grip was a different material, either tall rubber structures for grip, or translucent plastic with shallow grooves. For the props, only the shape remains. As a bonus, the handle has already been optimized. A large company spent a lot of money designing this shape to perfectly fit the human hand. You'll find the maker of the banana, Almighty God, has made it with a non-slip surface. It was also meant to look nice on the shelf, just like the Comlink would. I can believe two galaxies came up with this design on their own. As for the expansion slot, that was not present on the original Razor. Even that detail is critical, otherwise the blood sensor would be built in. Making it modular allows the Jedi to buy standard Comlinks off the shelf. The confusing part is why Obi-Wan is involved. What's the Mison telescope doing if Qui-Gon has the MIDI sensors? All we can tell is that it must be some kind of analysis, processing the data that comes over the radio in some complex manner. Anything more would be just speculation. The next logical question is how Palpatine escaped detection. We know that Naboo is a planet within the Republic. They have their own senator. The chair recognizes the senator from the sovereign system of Naboo. Jedi expect all Force sensitives to be detected. Surely that means Senator Palpatine has been tested in the past. In fact, he should have been identified as a baby and trained as a Jedi. Had he been born in the Republic, we would have identified him earlier. One answer would be that Palpatine was detected. Everything went exactly as planned. The test found him, so the Jedi arrived. Oddly enough, the parents decided not to give away their infant son. That would mean the Jedi know Senator Palpatine is Force sensitive. Under that interpretation, the story still works. Declining an offer of Jedi training isn't a crime. Unlike the audience, the Jedi Council doesn't know he'll become Emperor. I know you would. I can feel your anger. I'm going to turn you over to the Jedi Council. If it's public knowledge already, there's no risk of a test giving away the plan. Everyone knows Senator Palpatine's midichlorian count. It's no secret. On the other hand, the system is easily bamboozled. Pull up, pull back. There's one of your boys. Oh. It would be easy for the wrong blood sample to be submitted. Perhaps the data kept getting corrupted during transmission. Most likely, Naboo reports all the force sensitives that it can find. Palpatine was tested, detected as normal, and put on a list. By the time that list was broadcast at the end of the month, one name had gone missing. In an unrelated note, the Palpatine estate donated a luxury landspeeder to a subspace comm technician. The midichlorian testing isn't meant to have a perfect detection rate. All that matters is creating a large pool of potential Jedi recruits. Knights are sent out to recruit as many as possible. From there, the child is taken to the Jedi head office. I'll watch out for him. You have my word. Will you be all right? By now, everyone should be familiar with the Republic Senate. A fairly short distance away, there is another relevant building. The Jedi Temple is somewhere over the horizon from the Senate. The geography isn't clearly established. We never see the two buildings on screen at the same time. May the Force be with you. No discussion of the Old Republic could be complete without mentioning the Jedi Knights. Both organizations date back to the edge of recorded history. Remember exactly what Obi-Wan told us about their ages. Jedi and Republic have worked together for 25,000 years. For over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the old Republic. Where did the Jedi Knights come from? That depends who you ask and when. Our old law specifies that Jedi originate on the planet Ossus, 
The expanded universe was careful in how this was phrased. Well-informed Star Wars characters believe Jedi came from Ossus. This lore was specifically designed with the intention of being modified. Some kind of Jedi planet was needed, and we know there was a first one. The lore goes out of its way to say other Jedi worlds can be created. Ossus was meant to be one of the earliest, the best guess that's widely known by experts. We know beyond any doubt that Ossus was an ancient Jedi world. Ossus was at the far end of the Perlemian trade route. Of the two main hyperlanes, this was the spinward of the two. At the time, this was as far away as the Republic extended. Their choice of home was quite good since it lasted 20 millennia. Eventually, Ossus was devastated in the year 3996 BBY. It's important to understand that back in AD 1998, the Jedi weren't associated with Coruscant. The Jedi had been based at the edge of the galaxy. The government was located in the center of the galaxy, as far away as possible. We often divide the galaxy into two main parts, the rim and the core. Luke Skywalker lives on the outer rim, which implies at least one other rim region. The outer rim, the mid rim, and the inner rim. Most of the planets we see are somewhere in the outer rim, with few exceptions. Ossus, Tatooine, Kessel, Dagobah, Sullust, Yavin, Endor, Ryloth, Bespin, Mon Calamari, Dantooine, and Dathomir. There are quite a few recognizable place names, many of them spoken in the movie. Other rim regions don't have quite as many. To an average fan, the mid rim is most notable for its distinctive alien races. Wookiees from Kashyyyk, Ithorians from Ithor, Rodians from Rodia. Another notable location is Ord Mantel, mentioned in episode 5. Solo had visited the world not long ago. I thought you had decided to stay. Well, the bounty hunter we ran into when Ord Mandel changed my mind. Han actually says Ord Mandel instead of Ord Mantel. You could call that a retcon, something the expanded universe got wrong. Given that the novelization spells it with a T, I doubt that. Han Solo just has a very thick Corellian accent. All that's left is the Inner Rim region. This one has even less of note. One of our best references to the Inner Rim involves Han again. Well, look at you, a general, huh? <laughs> Someone must have told him about my little maneuver at the Battle of Tanev. Well, don't look at me, pal. Lando mentions the Battle of Tanab, where he single-handedly destroyed a fleet of pirates. This establishes Lando as more of a tactical genius than a pilot. The other two most notable worlds in the region are Onderon and Bestin. The latter is actually a reused name. Bestin is a town on Tatooine. That's not really surprising. A lot of colonies give old names to their new towns. Bestin is the homeworld of Jake Pawkins, hero of the Rebel Alliance. The name is a bitter joke. One Bestine is an ocean planet, the other is a town in the desert. Much of the Star War takes place on the Galactic Rim. The core of the galaxy has its own regions, though they are a bit smaller. Its outer shell is called the Colonies region. These are some of the oldest colonies in the galaxy, founded about 20,000 years ago. Next, there is the ancient seed of the Republic, the Core Worlds. Despite the name, there is another layer. We call the very center region the Deep Core. In this part of the galaxy, stars are so densely clustered they affect hyperspace. All these overlapping gravity wells play havoc with the Navi computers. For all of galactic history, the Deep Core has been seen as more trouble than it's worth. For 25,000 years it sat undeveloped. Even after the fall of the Empire, the Deep Core is mostly uncharted. If it could be done, Deep Core settlements would be extremely valuable. That would be guaranteed, given its location near Coruscant. Naturally, there was some early expansion, but it didn't get far. Before there was an old republic, human colonization used generation ships. Ten levels of environmental engineering, crew quarters, schools, wastewater treatment, machine shops, forges. After traveling for several lifetimes, one such ship arrived at Koros. This would go on to become one of the more prominent deep core colonies. Koros exported raw materials for carbonite, which would be used in new ship types. After generation ships came sleeper ships, using carbonite freezing on the passengers. These used a dimensional drive, an extremely primitive form of faster than light. Remember when Han boasted about the speed of his ship? What a piece of junk! She'll make 0.5 past light speed. She may not look like much, but she's got it where it counts, kid. Before we knew about hyperdrive classes, that just meant 1.5 times the speed of light. 
That's the level of performance these sleeper ships can manage. A dimensional drive can travel 40 light years in only 30 years. Eventually, hyperdrives were developed, making generation ships obsolete overnight. Galactic travel would now be practical, allowing the Republic to exist. Trade continued to flow much as it always had, only with the cargo arriving in hours instead of years. One of the oldest hyperspace trade routes is the Koros Trunk Line. This is exactly where we need to go, right into the core. A little way past Koros, the planet Tython is the entire reason for this geography lecture. Remember how the planet Ossus left room for an older Jedi world? As time went on, a revised origin of the Jedi cropped up. Tython was the site of a conflict known as the Force Wars. The dark side of the Force had tempted many on Tython. Left to its own devices, that's what the dark side does. All it needs is a supply of Force-sensitive individuals. Sooner or later, one will get unlucky. The Jedi Order was created on Tython to oppose the dark side. Actually, I should bring up a few names. Before the Jedi, there were the Jedi. That's an apostrophe and a double I. Their name for the light side is Ashla. As for the dark side, they call that Bogan. Well, it was. Sadly. We're the Bogans from Buffalo. You heard me. It turns out Jedi have always been anti-Bogan. You don't know the power of the Bogan side. That accounts for the Jedi Order. Some of them left Tython and ventured forth into the galaxy. These wanderers were the first to be called Jedi Knights. After starting in the deep core, they made the longest journey possible. The Jedi Knights flew out along the Polemian trade route, as far as they could go. At last, the old and the less old lore come back together. The planet Ossus makes a return, for that is where the Jedi land. Back in these days, the Old Republic was very young and quite small. Without the Jedi to help, the Republic might have barely lasted a thousand years. Ossus was a planet at the edge of known space, along the longest hyperlane in the galaxy, a fortress monastery to guard the road against hut, despot, or anything else. This is why the Jedi have a reputation as guardians of the Republic. For anyone who lives on the Outer Rim, the Jedi are much closer than the Senate. That was the situation 25,000 years ago. Under the watchful eyes of the Jedi and Republic, civilization covered the galaxy. We can skip over a great deal of history here, since the Jedi are our real interest. The next moment we need to focus on is 7,000 years ago. At this point, the cordless lightsaber still hadn't been invented. Our Jedi friends are about to unleash a force with terrible powers. The finger is on the trigger. About to unleash a force with terrible powers, beyond the comprehension of man. How big of a mistake are they about to make? Bad enough that it has a name. The Hundred Year Darkness. This incident also changes the way we refer to Dark Jedi. Darth Vader, only you could be so bold. The Imperial Senate will not still for this. When they... Yes, afraid for you, as I always have been. I will be fine here. Whatever answers the Council have are for you alone. Know that much may happen here, but above all, do not forget this. You may trust in me. We cradle each other's lives, and what threatens one of us threatens us both. And if you find you cannot trust me, Trust in your training. Trust in yourself. Never doubt what you have done. All your decisions have brought you to this point. And now, perhaps, they shall see what you have become. It all started with a sect of Darksiders in the Jedi Order. That would seem to imply they were on Tython, where the Jedi Order was founded. Those who left the Deep Core for the planet Ossus were called Jedi Knights. Either way, the Bogan side of the Force figured out a few abilities. They learned how to mutate life using the Force. It allowed for all manner of abominations to be created. It reminds me of a Warhammer 40k character named Fabulous Bill. Since there weren't all that many Dark Jedi, they created a mutant army. The variety of soldiers was quite remarkable. 
most of the army was still vaguely humanoid, with inconsistent workmanship. Make us whole again. Some might have claws and inhuman strength, while others are barely able to stand. More powerful bogans were able to create giant monsters, walking siege engines. Not even these minions could manage to secure victory for the dark side. It took a century for the forces of niceness to triumph over the forces of rottenness. 86 report to headquarters immediately. Once it became clear that the Jedi were winning, the bad guys bravely ran away. Like the Jedi Knights, they fled from the deep core to the outer rim. Instead of stopping at the borders of known space, the Darksiders kept flying onward. Out in the uncharted territories, the Bogans discovered an inhabited planet. You may have heard of it. The planet is Korriban, and the native species was named Sith. This is when the Dark Jedi and the Sith first joined forces. As a species, the Sith had been around for quite some time. Korriban had been attacked by two interstellar empires in its history, by the insectoid Killik and the Rakatan Infinite Empire. Both times, the Sith had enough experience with the Force to fight off the invaders. For the third set of interlopers, the result was quite different. The Bogans had access to Jedi lore, as well as experience with the Dark Side. Unlike the natives, the exiled Jedi arrived with starships and hyperdrives. Sith and Bogan joined forces to create a small Sith Empire. For a couple of millennia, everything seemed fine. This new Sith Empire had forgotten its hyperspace routes and galactic maps. They were lost at the edge of the galaxy, expanding into nearby star systems. The Republic had never known where the Dark Jedi fled to, only their trajectory. While the Sith Empire would have liked to strike back, it didn't know which direction to look. This created a period of relative peace. Civilization continued to expand throughout the galaxy, adding new colonies and hyperlanes. Plans for the development of the outlying regions of the galaxy involve the building of a hyperspace express route through your star system. And your planet is one of those scheduled for demolition. This is where we bring in the Great Hyperspace War. Around the year 5000 BBY, the light and dark sides came back into conflict. Explorers from the Republic stumbled upon the planet Korriban. Nobody will be surprised to hear they arrived during a Sith power struggle. Being a Sith is all about waiting for the moment where you get to betray someone. Every apprentice is prepared to kill his master, and vice versa. Kill him. Kill him now. In this case, the Sith Empire was under new management. Marka Ragnos, the old king of Korriban, had died. Two candidates stood out as potential replacements. Ludo Kresh preferred to gain power to develop a tall civilization, an empire with relatively small borders, and complete control of a tiny area. His opponent was Naga Sadao, who wanted to invade the Old Republic. Through a combination of brutal cunning and cunning brutality, Naga Sadao prevailed. That's not to say he got the most votes. Rather, Sadao had the strongest battle fleet. Starbreaker 12, the Republic scout ship, had been captured immediately. Soon after, Starbreaker escaped from the Sith Civil War. Naturally, it ran to the opposite side of the galaxy. Just as planned, for Naga Sadao had placed a homing beacon aboard. This finally solved the Sith Empire's navigational difficulties. Even worse, the scout ship had discovered a new hyperspace route. This was perfect for an invasion. It led straight from Korriban to the Deep Core. Instead of fighting their way through Republic territory, the Sith jumped directly to its heart. The Republic was caught completely off guard by the attack. Naga Sadao's fleet swept through multiple systems in the center of the galaxy. There was even a skirmish on Coruscant, mostly defeated by the Jedi. The Republic is far larger than the Sith Empire, with proportional naval capacity. Surprise was the primary advantage, striking before the Republic could respond. Naga Sadao pushed his luck as far as possible before retreating. Inevitably, the civilized galaxy rallied its fleet to strike back. That same hyperspace route runs in both directions, after all. The Republic retaliation fleet dropped back into real space above Korriban. Displaying the typical weakness of the Sith, they had been infighting. Ludo Kresh had ambushed Naga Sadao's returning fleet. Where Sadao once had the advantage, attrition from the war had brought balance. In the end, both sides of the Sith Civil War lost. 
Much of the Republic fleet was undamaged, having been stationed too far away to defend. This victory settled the Great Hyperspace War. Once again, the Jedi had defeated the Dark Jedi. They might have called themselves Sith, but at least they're gone now. In actual fact, Naga Sadao had escaped to the moon Yavin 4. Remember how the rebel base was hidden in some ancient ruins? That's right, they were built by the Sith. Specifically, the Masasi bodyguards Naga Sadao had brought with him. Other Sith forces scattered across the galaxy into the unknown regions. Once again, everything seems to be fine for a while, long enough for the Republic to get complacent again. By 4800 BBY, the Jedi invent the cordless lightsaber, that is to say, the modern form of the weapon. From this point onward, all lightsabers are as good as Luke's one. In fact, a saber might still work after being dropped 4000 years ago. They do not tend to wear out, and the power cell could last for years of use. History doesn't always give us the nice round thousand year gap between wars. This period of peace lasts six centuries. We pick up the story on Yavin 4, in the year 4400 BBY. A dark side force user emerges, and as always, he's an ex-Jedi. His name is Frieden Nad, and he manages to follow Naga Sadao. Having gained as much power as the Jedi would teach him, Nad looked elsewhere. Upon awakening Naga Sadao from hibernation, Nad studied the dark side. As is tradition, Naga Sadao was betrayed and murdered by his new apprentice. From there, Nad moved to the planet Onderon, a minor world outside the borders of the Old Republic. Nad's master had ruled the Sith Empire, so this world was easy to control. As the centuries ticked past, Frieden Nad eventually died. The Republic continued to expand, and in 4000 BBY it reached Onderon. Jedi Knights were sent to act as diplomats to settle tensions on a newly assimilated world. Onderon turned out to be a bastion of the dark side. The current ruler kept dark relics around, such as previous rulers. The Sarcophagus of Nad and an ancient king. This sarcophagus should contain the remains of Emperor Nimbala. Great jerky! Mm. My god, this is an outrage! I was going to eat that mummy! Both of these were not quite dead yet, and the Jedi disapproved. A reasonable reaction, considering the centuries of war on Onderon. The Sith can be directly blamed for most of that world's problems. In 3998, Republic ships brought peace through superior firepower. All the dark side relics were confiscated and locked into a vault of Mandalorian iron. This will not have been cheap, and it was commissioned with a service life of millennia. Hopefully, it will be worth the expense. Let's just quickly skip forward until the vault is opened. We pick up the story in the year 3997 BBY, one year later. That seal is a thousand times less effective than it was advertised to be. A young Jedi apprentice named Exar Kun walks up and cuts through the door. This is a perfect illustration of what we mean by lightsaber resistant materials. Close the blast doors! If you have a few hours alone with a door, even Mandalorian iron isn't good enough. They are still coming through. This is impossible! At this point, there can be only one outcome. An ambitious young Jedi, in a room with a bunch of Sith relics. Exar Kun immediately became apprenticed <coughs> to an undead Frieden Nad. He roamed around the galaxy for a while, visiting Sith worlds. From Onderon to Korriban and on to Yavin 4. At every stop, he collected more dark knowledge and power. When Exar Kun returned to the Jedi, he had some radical ideas to share. The pipeline! Down the old hatch! For a while, this was only a problem for his fellow Jedi. The wider galaxy doesn't really care that the youth of today have some funny ideas. It quickly stops being an internal Jedi matter. Around the year 4000 BBY, we encounter the Sith War. Cultists of Nad create a vast military called the Krath. These created enough battle droids and warships to threaten the galaxy. Yet again, ex-Jedi have caused a galactic war. It would take a great deal of droids to fight the Republic, too many to build in just a few years. 
The other half of the Krath military was the Mandalorians. Their combined forces posed a serious threat to the Republic. Without these fallen Jedi, most of these wars would never have happened. Though Exar Kun is eventually defeated, it was not without effort. Remember the planet Ossus, home to the Jedi Knights? Well, the Sith managed to use one of Naga Sadao's weapons to destroy it. Not completely, the planet is still there, but nobody would survive. The entire Jedi Order had to evacuate Ossus in 3996 BBY. This left several Jedi Knights available for a mission to track down Exar Kun. He had been hiding on Yavin 4, in one of the Masasi temples. With great compassion, the Jedi set the jungle on fire. There's no way that Exar Kun could possibly have survived that. This marked the end of the Sith War. The Republic shattered the Krath and defeated the Mandalorians. This moment is a seam where the prequels and the old lore are connected. With the planet Ossus devastated, the Jedi move their headquarters. They set up shop on Coruscant, in the very same temple from Episode 1. That leaves only a few thousand more years, the Mandalorian Wars, and up to the start of the prequel era. Remember how during the Sith War, half of the forces were Mandalorian? These are some of the only warriors in the galaxy capable of standing up to the Republic. Where the Krath had been thoroughly defeated, Mandalore was too far away from the Republic. Only a few decades after being defeated, Mandalore controls enough territory to make the Huts look small. You get it, because the Hut Empire is large, and the Huts are... <laughs> anyway, the Republic was not particularly eager to jump into another war. Much safer to let the situation get out of hand first. Jedi Knights, Guardians of Peace and Justice, also opposed the war. The Jedi are guardians of the peace, and have been for centuries. This call to war undermines all that we have worked for. The Jedi in general, that is. There were a few exceptions. We shall use a pair of examples, named Malak and Revan. They were much more interested in the defending than the peace part of the Jedi way. After consolidating power in the Outer Rim for a decade or so, Mandalore invaded. This was an excellent pretext for our heroic pair to prove their might in battle. Those unhip squares on the Jedi Council would never understand how cool this was. Revan might not be the nicest guy around, but he is quite good at war. Eventually, Revan defeated the leader of Mandalore, named Mandalore, in a duel. Occupied with opposing wars and protecting the innocent, the Jedi disapproved. It worked exactly as intended. By exploiting a loophole in the Mandalorian honor rituals, Revan officially ended the war. Immediately after the Mandalorian Wars, both of them fell to the dark side. Turns out the Jedi Council might know a thing or two about the risks. Peace lasted for several years, 3961 to 3958 BBY. This part of history is named the Second Sith War, or the Jedi Civil War. The newly named Darth Revan managed to steal an entire Republic fleet. Many officers and Jedi were willing to ignore the new name and that helmet of his. Darth's Malak and Revan returned to the old Sith Empire, allowing them to revive its name. This also makes sense defensively, keeping away from the heart of the Republic. Revan's empire was in the same place the Mandalorians had rampaged through earlier. The Second Sith War ended in much the same way as the Great Hyperspace War. That is to say, thanks to Darksiders and their infighting. Darth's Revan and Malak turned on each other, allowing the Republic to win. Revan was the victor of the internal struggle, defeating Darth Malak over Rakata Prime. With this newly created power vacuum, a new generation of Sith rose up to replace the Fallen. This period is called the Sith Civil War, a skirmish with malleable teams. Darth Sion, Darth Kreia, Darth Treya, and Darth Nihilus were not exactly friends. When the last Sith was destroyed, that should have been an end to it. The dark side seemed to have gone into hiding. There were no similar Star Wars for quite some time. In the year 3000 BBY, the galaxy was reshaped by a new hyperlane. The Hydean Way runs from one side of the galaxy to the other, passing by the core worlds. No longer would civilization be limited to the Slice. This new road allowed for entire new regions to be settled. All seemed well until the year 2000 BBY. From the year 2000 to 1000 BBY, the Sith returned. If you've been paying attention, you can guess the course already. That's right, 
a former Jedi turned to evil and started a new Sith cult. Over that millennium, the Sith gained power in the usual way. By the year 1466 BBY, a Sith army was able to soundly defeat Jedi forces at Mizra. The Old Republic was beginning to get quite feeble and corrupt. Everything would finally be resolved 1,000 years ago. This was the Battle of Rusan in a time of grandiose names. The Brotherhood of Darkness versus the Army of Light. Despite losing, the Darksiders kept trying to negotiate. Sit down. Have a drink. Have a drink with you, Best out of three. No, five. No, seven. Despite going all the way up to seven, the Sith only managed to win two of the battles. At least this time, it seems to have had the desired effect. There would be no Sith empires popping up like mushrooms. We have returned. Only one Sith Lord had managed to survive, having been poisoned and left for dead. His name was Darth Bane, and he invented something called the Rule of Two. Instead of forming an empire, the new Sith would focus on stealth. Always two there are. No more, no less. A master and an apprentice. Meanwhile, the Old Republic tried to recover from the previous era. Centuries of decay have left it in bad shape. In the year 1000 BBY, the Republic was transformed. It was called the Rusan Reformations. This moment is another scene where the Phantom Menace is attached. I may have exaggerated how perfectly the prequels line up. Expanded Universe lore does not show quite the same Republic, yet because of the time differences involved, both versions can exist. Everyone always knew the time of the prequels was off-limits. Foresight allowed Lucas the freedom to tell his own story. Locked out. Even I can't get past the security. All it required was an event in the history of Star Wars. After we found out what Lucas's prequels looked like, that defined the galaxy. We know that in Anakin's time, the Senate had those floating pods. If you go back far enough in history, those would change and disappear. The same principle applies to the Republic itself. A thousand years ago, the galaxy became more Lucas-like. First of all, the Supreme Chancellor is named Valorum. The Rusan reformations were the work of Tarsus Valorum. This man is clearly the ancestor to our Finnis Valorum. Most changes are required because of the first two prequel movies. Lucas shows the Senate granting ultimate power to Palpatine. I love democracy. A thousand years ago, the Senate was given that authority. Previously, the Chancellor had considerably more personal influence. Another unexpected change was the state of the Republic's military. Attack of the Clones implies there is no Republic army or navy. This is a crisis. The Senate must vote the Chancellor emergency powers. He can then approve the creation of an army. Since one had already been depicted, this moment removed the army. The final stroke was for the Jedi to be given Republic status. Instead of an unofficial understanding, the government can now give orders. Sending a secret mission to Naboo, for example, or Palpatine appointing members of the Jedi Council. The Council doesn't like it when he interferes in Jedi affairs. I swear to you, I didn't ask to be put on the Council. That brings us back around to the present day. The scene is set for Skywalker to join the Jedi. Be mindful of your feelings. Your thoughts dwell on your mother. In order to continue the recruitment process, Qui-Gon must report his findings. After a long and exasperating mission, the Master Jedi has arrived back home. Next, he must report in to the Jedi Council. Obviously, they live in the highest room of the tallest tower. They are spellcasters after all. You've got to build towers to keep your wizards in. Hey, Graham, I'm not in the room, right? What room? I want to cast magic missile. The room where he's casting all these spells from. What if I told you the Jedi Council are in a different location? If you tried to bomb the top of the tower, you would inevitably miss. Act on this, we must. You see, the Jedi Temple is a rather large building. Right at the top of the ziggurat are five spires. Summon more ziggurats. These are laid out in a cross, like five pips on a die. One in each corner of the square, plus a larger tower in the middle. The four around the edge all look the same, where the center tower has additional wings. It looks like a large observation platform, right below the tip of the tallest tower. If you're anything like me, you will have assumed the Jedi leaders picked the center tower. 
There can be no argument. The council chambers are at the top of a tower. One of the four small towers around the edge. Definitely not the central tower. This has always been right there in the movie. It was clearly intended. All four peripheral towers have the correct windows at the top. The central one does not. For the tower closest to the camera, we can see the floor inside the council chamber. Books of the time also support this fact. All four towers have similar rooms at the top, all for a Jedi Council. One tower for the High Council, which is the only one we ever see. The others are the Councils of Reconciliation, the Assignment, and First Knowledge. By far the funniest of these is the Reassignment Council, whose job it is to fire Jedi. Whenever an apprentice can't find anyone willing to train him, he visits the Council. Luckily, Anakin will not need to encounter the Reassignment Council. You seem a little on edge. Now that you know about the real layout of the Jedi Temple, there is one nagging question. What is the central tower for? We have 862 pages of cross-section books to show just that. According to Inside the Worlds, the tower is full of levitating statues. Qui-Gon is not fooled by this unintuitive architecture. He is a mighty enough Jedi to have earned a place on the High Council. If you would just follow the code, you would be on the Council. Of course he knows the room. He's been summoned there often enough. You still have much to learn, my young apprentice. Qui-Gon describes being attacked by a powerful dark side practitioner using a red-bladed lightsaber. Based on the history of the galaxy, I would say Sith is a fair assumption. The Sith have been extinct for a millennium. I do not believe the Sith could have returned without us knowing. The Council does not agree. His complaint of nearly being cut in half? Completely dismissed. <laughs> right. All the Council has to offer are platitudes. We will use all our resources to unravel this mystery. We will discover the identity of your attacker. They respond as if Qui-Gon is prone to exaggerating. Sith Lords have caused at least one war every few thousand years. Unless you think Qui-Gon's report is completely unreliable, it seems like a big deal. The sort of thing you might send another two knights to investigate. Deciding he will get no traction on this issue, Jin brings up his other discovery. Master Qui-Gon, more to say of you? With your permission, my master. Normally, the Council wouldn't be involved with recruitment. Skywalker is a special case. Nothing about his apprenticeship was normal. I have encountered a virgence in the Force. A virgence, you say? Notice the way Qui-Gon phrases his report. He found a virgence in the Force instead of a future Jedi. This is an odd word clearly related to focus, to diverge, to converge. In context, the meaning is basically subspace anomaly, something out of place. Qui-Gon says that the Force behaves strangely around little Annie. That makes the boy an object of interest, one the Council would like to examine. Bring him before us then. Now that we know a little about the Jedi, we can see how Anakin interacts with them. What tests do the Jedi want to see? What's all this about a prophecy, a chosen one? We hope you will join us again for the next episode. They're right next to you. I cast a spell. Where's the Mountain Dew? In the fridge, duh. I want to cast a spell. Can I have a Mountain Dew? Yes, you can have a Mountain Dew, just don't get it. That's it for this video. Thanks for sticking around until the very end. We're trying to get each new part out at the same time every week. It'd pay to make sure you've got notifications turned on, so you'll know as soon as that happens. There are two ways to support us. Become a patron at patreon.com slash thebreadcircus, or subscribe, like, and comment. Only the former option guarantees that your name lives on in history. The other is embarrassing youtube -y stuff. Brandon Smith is clearly using a pseudonym. Das Lol Tractor has a Lamborghini tractor he wants us to know about. John Back, a Corolla pilot and a good friend. Kamikaze Velociraptor, the worst kind of lizard. Might also be a girl. Conk, 
the only thing worse than a Discord moderator, an Australian. And Zafrax, who gave us a whole bunch of money and then disappeared. What, you think you're some kind of Jedi waving your hand around like that? I'm a Toydarian! My tricks gonna work on me, only money. No money, no parts, no deal. <laughs>